Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's been a quite a delay to start this uh, topic. It's a very important topic in the current scenario based on this the pandemic we are facing. So, the all the, the entire focus is on the aspect of treating the patients on an acute basis. But I wanted to share this talk, especially on post-COVID rehab, in which we focus on the aftermath after the COVID-19 infection. All right. I thank Elevate Pain Clinics for having offered me to share this as a platform not only uh, to the doctors as well as to the non-doctors non and the other healthcare professionals and the general public as well to as, uh, as a guide to help them uh, you know kind of help our near and dear ones who have faced this issue okay so we'll be dealing with a, a bit of the myths surrounding this particular condition as of now there are a lot of myths so we will try to deal with them one by one okay so the most commonly what we get to hear is all is well once a covid positive patient tests negative is it true we shall have a look let's see some facts before that even though COVID-19 mainly affects the respiratory system, evidence does indicate that it's a multi-system disease with multi-organ effects involving the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the muscular system with symptoms lasting more than four weeks. Let's see some other numbers associated with the, the rehab aspect. All right. All patients with prolonged ICU care have a long course to recovery. Okay. And let me tell you, we are not talking about the recovery in the ICU. We are talking about a phase once they have come out of the ICU, they are in the comfort of their homes, okay? And that time they do face a lot of issues. 45% of the patients discharged in the hospital will still require healthcare support. Now, this is based on history, okay? History is there that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Like from example, from the SARS outbreak, there have been a lot of literature coming after that. There have been a uh, one to two year study wherein they have seen that the, uh, the SARS survivors required healthcare support for more than three to four years after they were being infected and treated. So likely even patients with mild symptoms often take more than four weeks to get back to the pre-COVID effort tolerance. So why rehab? Rehab programs are best initiated, which are initiated best within 30 days, have, have the greatest impact on recovery. All right. And what is the need for rehab and to have such protocols? So rehab, first of all, let's look, look at what is rehabilitation. So rehabilitation basically involves a certain set of interventions, which are finally focus on reducing the morbidity, which the patient is suffering from. Because he is in, he's not in the uh, hospital setup anymore, he is interacting with his environment and he is in a phase where he has not come back to his pre-COVID tolerance, exercise, may be it exercise tolerance or as functioning as a social being within the society. So this rehabilitation is patient centered and tailored to individual needs, taking into consideration their comorbidities and current condition, which is very important. That goes to say that we cannot apply all these norms and rehab protocols to each and everybody. So there has to be a proper assessment for which education plays a key part in any successful rehabilitation program and prevention of COVID related pain syndromes. So me being a, a consultant pain physician, why this topic you would one would wonder because in literature, a lot of evidence is cropping up from the from the Western literature, of course, that these kind of patients who have been suffered from COVID-19, they do land up in a lot of chronic pain syndromes and issues. Having said that, 
Prudent monitoring through any rehabilitation process is mandatory because they are in a state of a very fragile state of in, in respect to the mentality as well as the physical status. So they have to be constant monitoring with respect to their tolerance level and with respect to the uh, amount of suffering they had been undergone during treatment of the COVID scenario. So, as I said earlier, right now the focus is almost on the immediate response and the immediate treatment of COVID, which is very vital in the aspect of saving the life of the patient. But rehab focuses on the problems faced after that. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, there could be a possibility of chronic pain as a consequence. There could be in, term, in terms of chronic fatigue syndrome, polymyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica or even very commonly seen fibromyalgia. Why does it happen? All right. So, a certain insight into that because it uh, certainly affects the central nervous system which is involved in basically the system which is involved in the movement and also affects our cognitive aspect of the human body. So, why does this happen? As we know, movement is life. When there is movement, then there is life. So, the reduced health related physical activities during the part because of the sedentary life as a part of their treatment could be in a simple non-ICU scenario or even in the ICU scenario. So, they will not be doing those activities which are vital in man managing certain chronic pain states. All right. And again, why we have? We all know the impact of exercise on the immune system. All right. So, there have been studies stating that the patients who were physically active prior to the infection had good rates of recovery compared to the patients who were not so active and uh, having a sedentary lifestyle. All right. So, for this talk especially, I have chosen uh, the guidelines which have been published by the John Hopkins Medicine Network, W Health Organization as well as the National Health Services. So, what are the main domains of rehabilitation? As you can see on the screen, there are six main domains of rehabilitation. That only goes to say the story of the impact of COVID on the health of any on, on any individual or the patient. They would be having pulmonary issues, cardiac affects the mentality of the patient, the mental health of the patient. Most importantly, the musculoskeletal aspect along with the neuro rehabilitation and the general medical rehabilitation which is also very important because isolate if you isolate the COVID issue, they could be already having certain pre-existing conditions which also have to be taken into account while considering them for rehab and, pres and prescribing exercise as a modality. Let me be very clear, we are not prescribing exercise as a treatment for COVID-19 here. We are just saying the importance of exercise in the post-COVID recovery phase so that we are helping them to get back to their normal life and their quality of life improves as the exercise tolerance improves. So coming to the pulmonary rehabilitation. So, exercise training is considered foundation of the pulmonary rehabilitation and is included in 76 to 100 percent of the programs internationally. So, what happens in patients who are who were who had a severe consequence of COVID-19, who are requiring oxygen therapy, low intensity exercises that is the equivalent of meds of equivalent of three or lesser than three should be considered in these particular patients. Who require oxygen therapy and how do you phase them after that so it should be a gradually phased improvement according to the exercise tolerance of the patient and also the symptoms they face so <clears throat> just a little bit about the cardiac rehabilitation so one of the feared most feared consequence of uh, as a cardiac consequence would be myocarditis so, it could happen with anyone, I mean to say 
could be an elderly patient or a young patient, could be an athlete who was physically fit. And then it's always a challenge to get back to their level of activity, uh, which was at the pre-COVID level. So they have to be ready, prepared that it could take years and it will also require periodic reassessment from the cardiologist or the treating physician with respect to ECG or echo, echocardiogram. So coming to the psychological rehabilitation, we have already seen the how COVID affects the, the psyche of the patient. All right. And it is more than that. It, they do have cognitive impairments they, along with the physical impairments. And it was more important to identify the high risk group. So active monitoring of these subthreshold psycholo psychological symptoms in, the, in these patients is also very important. And who will do this? So this has to be done by a healthcare provider and then they have to adequately refer these patients to the particular doctor or the healthcare professional. So common therapies they could employ would be the cognitive behavior therapy or the CPT. So coming to the most important aspect now, which is the musculoskeletal rehabilitation. All right. Why I would focus on this is that because as you improve this phase, automatically we see gradual imp uh, improvements in the rest of the domains as well. Okay. And these musculoskeletal issues need not be attributed to the primary disease process itself. Okay. For example, we have something called as ICU associated weakness. I'm sure my fellow colleagues would agree, the intensivists and the doctors keenly working with these patients in intensive care units would see that the patient has polymyopathy, they have weakness, fatigue syndrome. All right, this is all related to their stay in the ICU. And also something called as a post ICU syndrome, which is like a triad of cognitive, psychological and physical impairments. So how do we offer these therapies? We can have patient directed exercises or in home therapy sessions or a telehealth delivery of therapy. And more important, we do have to focus on the pain management, wherein uh, doctors like us in Alleviate do come in handy for the pain management, not only for the acute pain which they experience, also the exacerbation of the probable chronic conditions which they already had. Once a person develops COVID-19 infection, advise rest as much as possible till he or she feels completely okay. Now, is it true? No. To circumstantiate my statement, I would like to list the importance of exercise and how it benefits an individual. It improves fitness and in uh, patients of post-COVID uh, a recovery phase reduces breathlessness, it increases muscle strength, improves balance and coordination, improves thinking, reduces stress and improves mood. It also increases confidence and improves your energy. But hold on, this is not the end of the spectrum. So adequate assessment is definitely required. So what do we do in this assessment? So basically we try to categorize the individual or the patient in the post recovery phase, other whether they are severe, having severe symptoms or mild to moderate symptoms, or just they're just asymptomatic. All right. So severe sore throat, body ache, shortness of breath, general fatigue, chest pain, cough, fever definitely would suggest that they are in the category of with severe symptoms. All right, and that becomes like a rat model. We use commonly used in the chronic pain scenarios we have to recognize. So now we have to recognize is this because per se because of the COVID-19 or there is something new and then treat accordingly. But they have to avoid exercise. It is, it is strictly not prescribed for these patients and they have to avoid it at least two to three weeks. Okay. So coming to the mild symptoms. That is, they have to be having, they have to be active, but not continuously with light activity and they should limit their sedentary periods 
and avoid prolonged exhaustive or high intensity training which is obvious which would only exacerbate their symptoms so coming to some evidence the stanford hall consensus what does it state asymptomatic positive covid-19 patients patients with very mild symptoms or mild to moderate covid-19 illness you can prescribe exercise as a part of rehab okay patients with covid-19 who experience the following symptoms as i mentioned earlier like sore throat severe sore throat body aches shortness of breath general fatigue chest pain cough or fever should avoid exercises that is more than a uh, metabolic equivalent of 3 for between 2 weeks and 3 weeks after the cessation of those symptoms all right now we have excess now we have prescribed exercise now we do need to assess are they or is the exercise level adequate okay so it's obvious when you start exercising your cardiovascular endurance increases your heart rate increases you be, you do become a bit breathless but if you are so feeling so breathless that you cannot speak a whole sentence without stopping and not and, and but you are not feeling breathless that means it's not at all adequate whereas you cannot speak at all or can only say a word at a time and are severely breathless severely mind you it's severely breathless that means you're pushing yourself too hard or you're being pushed too hard so it's time to step down and to maintain that adequate level or you can speak a sentence pausing only once or twice to catch your breath and are moderately breathless this would be the adequate level all right and of course i'll come back to this what do i mean by the red alerts all right now coming to the method so as i said uh, there have been various rehabilitation programs one of the one, one of the ones <clears throat> described by john hopkins rehabilitation network mainly has three phases the beginning phase the building phase and the being phase all right so now who, who decides in which phase you are you can definitely take help of a health professional uh, who are uh, doing these kind of services all right or else you can also can test your exercise tolerance what level of activity you can undergo and you are comfortable with and then choose the kind of exercises which are within the following headings that could be the beginning phase the building phase or the being phase so there are five important components of rehab in this you can see on the left hand side that involves breathing exercises also involves exercises which kind of activate the vestibular system and the cross body exercises which mainly works on the core and then strength building exercises and more importantly you have the exercises which help you in gaining endurance all right so you can start off according to your exercise tolerance and according to your physical activity and you can slowly upgrade yourself from the beginning phase the building phase and the being phase mind you this is not a fitness program what you see in the normal day like a cult fitness or something like that it is a very simple body movements which finally help in the process of rehabilitation okay we will come back to each one of them all right so in the beginning phase with the cardio pulmonary rehab we do have this deep breathing exercises which you can do lying flat on the bed with your legs folded and with your arms tucked on placed on the belly and just we can do it for a minute keep repeating you take good deep breaths and see the movement of the fingers over your abdomen to say that you are taking an adequate breath but mind you again and again i say it's a staged paced kind of program there is no hurry there is no need to push yourself a simple deep breathing exercise can also cause exertion depending upon the comorbidities and the age of the patient so all these things have to be kept in mind when you do prescribe these things for the patients or any individual so it can be done in the prone position as well you repeat it for keep repeating it for a minute in the prone also you can just keep your hands over your forehead so that there is enough space 
between for you to take a deep, good deep breaths. Okay. And along with that, you can also keep humming or chanting even or even chanting Om, the letter Om, which has very powerful consequences in recovery and also it helps to stabilize your vocal cords, which also could be affected if the patient or the individual has undergone a prolonged ICU stay, ICU stay sorry, with who has been intubated and ventilated for a long time. All right. Then in the beginning phase itself, you can see the neurovestibular rehabilitation which just involves So, as you look up, you take a deep breath and you look up and then you exhale and you look down. You can do that for 30 seconds and then you can do the sideways eye nods as you, as you uh, push your eyes towards the right, combine it with an inhalation and as you come back to the center, exhale and repeat the same thing on the left side. All right. And then you can do something called as a turnover in your own bed, all right, a kind of an exercise wherein initially you saw that you should turn your eyes to the right side and then the head comes and then the body turns, all right. This thing you can, all three you can face for about three minutes. So in the beginning phase, again, the aspect of musculoskeletal rehab. As I spoke earlier, the cross body movements, all right, we are talking about the beginning phase, all right, so the patient is lying down and then you have, you have your arms by your side and then you alternate with the right hand reaching up to the left leg with your eyes focused on something on, on the top, on the ceiling or the ceiling, keeping it fixed and then, uh, you know, timing it with your breath. So as you try to touch the leg, you are taking an inhalation and as you come back, you exhale. It could be also done in a sitting over the bed, at the edge of the bed, probably. For, ended up smiling for three seconds. So, the cardiovascular endurance challenge here in this phase would be just walking for five minutes with the pace where you can speak full sentences without stopping. Now we move on to the building phase, which is the second phase. So the cardiopulmonary rehab in this would be just deep breathing exercises in sitting and standing posture with your hands stuck to the sides. All right, and you focus and you keep the focus at a particular eye level, fixed your gaze fixed, and then you take a deep breath and a deep inhalation and a deep exhalation. And coming to the neurovestibular vestibular rehabilitation of the building phase, we do have this head nods, the side nods and the, so as you can see in the first image, we are just moving your head up and down and, and you are combining it with an inhalation as you go up and a, and a deep exhalation as you go down, alright. And this can be done in the side, sidewards nods as well where you look into one side, like the right side and take a good inhalation, come to the center, exhale and then again inhalation and turn your head towards the left side and repeat it for a minute. Then we have something called as rocking on the chair, alright. So now as you can observe, you have to maintain a straight back and you have to extend your arms into, you know, to, the, to the front and then fix your gaze in the front, alright. And then as you lift your arm, you take a good deep inhalation, with an exhalation you just come down, uh, bring your arms to the side, alright. Importance is you have to keep a straight back, the spine uh, has to be maintained. That was in the sitting position, same thing you can do in the standing position as well. So, focusing on the musculoskeletal rehab in the building phase. So again, it's the same thing, the same pattern. You have something for the pulmonary, you have something for the cross body, a movement, and then you have the activating the neurovestibular system, and then you have the muscle uh, strength building exercises, 
and then you have the cardiovascular endurance part. So the cross body you have you seeing that you are sitting on the chair with the arms outstretched initially and then again you try to cross over. This is almost the same thing in the uh, beginning phase but you are doing it on the chair right now. And then you can have simple biceps curls. So you can use, you need not use weights as such. Even if you are using weights it should be something like 0.5 kg to 1 kg to begin with or you can even use water bottles and then you do a nice curl that is you flex your elbow completely with a good time it with a good inhalation and as you exhale you do a complete elbow extension and then these are the seated shoulder press ok so you start off with your arms at the side with the weight of your choice and your comfort it's not like some you are doing something in the gym or uh, pushing yourself this is very simple and according to your tolerance you use your weights and you start off at the side and with a good inhalation you push your shoulders up and then in an the exhalation you come down you can do these things three things for a minute repeat them for a minute and again the cardiovascular endurance challenge in this particular phase would be which was 5 minutes of walk now it's 10 minutes of walking where in the pace where you can speak full sentences all right coming to the cardiopulmonary rehab in the being phase now we are in the third phase well, slowly your endurance is improving and you are in the third phase right now so what do you do so it is just thing but a deep breathing standing with a good inhalation and an exhalation and as you observe your hands are towards your sides and then now you are challenging, challenging yourself more with the neurovestibular part activation part that is with the hand on knees the quad rockers basically so you are, on, uh, you are on your hands and knees initially to begin with and then you slowly rock yourself back and front as much as possible in your own pace keeping the neck slightly you know in the front and you, you can uh, fix your gaze alright and then you have the windshield wipers wherein you can see the arms are outstretched neck is neutral your gaze fixed your legs are flexed at the knee 90 degrees hip 90 degrees and then you try to move to either sides and timing it with your breathing pattern ok but more importantly you should see to it that your shoulders are fixed onto the mattress or onto the bed and they don't rise up and down as you tilt your pelvis so coming to the little more vigorous musculoskeletal rehab with cross body movement especially cross body movements as I told you are for the core they help you for the good improving your hand eye coordination let me just introduce one particular concept over here of deconditioning why are we doing all this so there has been mental deconditioning and physical deconditioning when the patient suffers through such a critical illness alright so deconditioning is nothing but the process the body undergoes when there is a phase of a sedentary phase for a long time which is obvious because the patient would be receiving therapy treatment that could be ICU based or non ICU based so he's not doing his activities and the body starts adapting to that sedentary phase so these are the changes and these are the changes which come under the deconditioning phase so we are trying to bounce back we are trying to you know revert those changes into the normal normalcy which the patient was in the pre covid phase all right so we have to train something which you already have we have to train it we have to activate it so the cross body particular exercises are very important in that aspect so you can lift your arm and the opposite leg and stretch out stretch it alternating alternatingly you can do it for a minute and again you have to time it with your breathing so again the cross crawl standing you do it in the, in the standing phase in this again you have to maintain adequate balance you can take support of the wall or you can do it if you are confident enough you can just stand and do it ok and you also let others help you you can also take help of somebody to you know look after you and take care of you during these exercises as well so coming to the wall push ups <clears throat> so initially you will have to uh, approximately stand 3 feet away and the width the leg width would be in comparison with the shoulder width and then the hand width also will be just slightly away from the shoulder width and then you start off with a good inhalation and you go down exhale come back 
and get give a good nice stretch to the tricep muscles all right and lastly we have the <coughs> standing leg raises so mainly targeting the calf muscles you time it with your uh, breathing with the good inhalation as you go up exhalation as you come down so the cardiovascular endurance in the final phase the being phase would be at least to walk 30 to 45 minutes where you can speak a sentence without much of stopping all right so again and again i keep saying the same thing it's graded it it is phase the gradual pace there is no need to push yourself which comes to the uh, which brings me to the third myth that rehabilitation in covid is pushing oneself to get back to normal now we already know the answer it's not true whereas there are a lot of things to be kept in mind like do not start exercise if you are having fever or your dyspnea address you have chest pain palpitations or you have fever edema and you have to stop exercising immediately when you experience dizziness dyspnea worsens there is chest pain excessive fatigue and you start sweating the cold clammy extremities we can do something at this moment all right which i will be discussing later but if this is really bad situation and if you feel you have to immediately consult for a healthcare personnel or a treating doctor okay that was about <clears throat> that particular rehab program and now coming to the nhs part and i have just picked a few interesting points what they highlight in this particular uh, uh, program that is nothing but the active cycle of breathing techniques which you call as acbt and they help you to clear your sputum from your chest and what are the types of breathing you have controlled breathing deep breathing and huffing so controlled breathing you might see a, a little bit of overlap what is this controlled breathing controlled breathing is basically you are trying to relax yourself all right something similar to a pranayam exercises the breathing exercises which you would be doing already in your pre covid state so it basically helps you to relax it involves nothing but closing your eyes and taking a good deep breath and exhalation all right with the immediate exhalation which is which pattern changes with the deep breathing all right so the only change over here is that you you take a nice good inhalation and you pause for maybe a couple of seconds and then you exhale all right mind you this has to be done under supervision of a medical care professional in the beginning if you are in that mild to moderate kind of uh, variety of symptoms okay if you are asymptomatic you can go ahead with these and something called as huffing so huffing mainly helps in expelling the sputum from different parts of the lung all right so we have this cycle of breathing all right where you can start with breathing controlled breathing go ahead with deep breathing then again a controlled breathing then as you do that you are trying to mobilize the sputum if it's there collected all right so we can start off with a big short huff or a small long huff so as i said huffing what is this so basically you can imagine yourself trying to mist the mirror so your your mouth is wide open and you're directly exhaling exhaling from your throat okay why you do that misting the mirror kind of a mechanism right so you can do it as a small long huff huff or a big short huff so that mobilizes the sputum from the lungs you have to see to it that you don't do it for a prolonged time where it ends up in you having a wheeze if you are wheezing that means you have pushed yourself too hard with it so there's few questions which have been uh, also mentioned in the program how long should i do it when should i do it again it depends on uh, how much uh, how often you feel that there is sputum in your lung and how often you feel the necessity to uh, expel it especially it could be during the time of uh, as you are exercising also all right so you can take a break do these uh, respiratory movements and then get back to your exercises all right so what position again it is prescribed by the uh, uh, as it is as i said it was, should be done under supervision so it should be prescribed by the medical care professional could be done sitting standing accordingly so there are certain rules you need to follow as per the nhs like and it is not only the nhs it is more obvious kind of rules like you know before you exercise warm up is required because you need to pro- you know kind of uh, prepare your body for that a little bit of 
uh, workout or the movements or the activity which you are going to do which could be in any of those phases and cool down as you know it helps in recovery and it prevents the muscle soreness meal timings you, know, you should not do it within an hour of having a meal good water intake because you do sweat and you should always back up your you know give yourself good well hydrated so for that you should avoid in very hot weather and very hot conditions all right in those is prescribed and you know we have a very popular acronym that is the sms which is sanitizing mask and social distancing because as you are doing we do not know your we when you prescribe your exercises to you or if you prescribe it to anybody we have to take in care of their environment and the government norms which are being installed in that particular country state or district so warm up exercises they do they for 5 minutes which makes you slightly breathless you could be sitting or standing each of the repetition for 2 to 4 times it could be normal shoulder shrugs shoulder circles side bends knee lifts ankle taps and ankle circles which are simple warm up exercises for different parts of your body which you can start off with and the fitness exercises which you can say in the being phase and uh, of the other program the john hopkins program they advise for you know 20 30 minutes 5 days a week which make you moderately almost if you are breathless and it's almost if you are breathless and can be done up to 30 seconds to 1 minute of activity which could be simply marching on the spot or step ups using your you know the, the staircase the flight of the stairs the first initial step you can use for the step ups alternating legs with the time with your you know breathing if it's too difficult to be done too debilitated you can always ask help and it can be done under supervision all right and walking so these you know you can see the metabolic equivalent it's somewhere around, around less or equivalent uh, less or uh, less or equal to 3 okay so these can be done that that doesn't mean there the, you have to avoid the sedentary phase as much as possi- as possible so coming to the strengthening exercises they do prescribe it for three sessions of every week three sets of 10 repetitions maintaining good posture completing it slowly in your own sweet time taking your own sweet time as as per your tolerance levels and also important of focus on your breathing so as i already described those exercises they, they do mention the same thing like bicep curls wall, wall push ups and side arm raises and even side sit to stand knee straightening exercises squats with the help of the support you can use the squat with the help of a chair or table you can support yourself and do the squats and even the heel raises heel raises as i showed earlier so cool down for 5 minutes again it helps you to bring your breathing back to normal so could be walking at a slow pace or a gentle marching or even the muscle stretches like the side bends or of the shoulder just keep, you know uh, putting a hand on the opposite shoulder and try to stretch it on the back of the thigh stretches low calf stretches or quad stretches the interesting thing they mention in the nhs is the about the exercise chart uh so this is quite motivating to the patient all right that you know they can physically see and do mention five days a week they can do that depending on the tolerance you can start with how many reps you did that day or the duration you can uh, mention and you can you know challenge yourself and push yourself slightly in a phased manner so that you try to achieve your kind of uh, physical tolerance which you had in the pre covid levels so coming a little bit of uh, things mentioned in the who guidelines other than this musculoskeletal and uh, pulmonary rehab and the neuro rehab which you already uh, been uh, seen through is managing problems in voice now why this is important as you know as i mentioned you have heard a lot of patients or your family members could be any individual in society who would have been intubated and treated in the icu as a critical illness so managing problems with the voice is like just talking when comfortable okay so that you don't strain yourself and humming to yourself that strengthens the vocal cords and for and as you can always use other ways of communicating like writing stuff down or possibly even gestures you can use gestures to get your job done and also sipping water throughout the day they suggest it helps you to manage your problems with the voice excuse me so something to manage problems with eating drinking and solving so they do recommend 
sitting upright whenever you eat and drink and remain upright for certain time after you had the meal and try foods of different consistencies and eat smaller meals throughout the day so managing activities of daily living so a little bit more on this as you know the human body is nothing but made up of memory it could be muscle memory thoughts you, uh, all these things so it's purely memory based right so we do have had certain certain amount of expectations and the quality of life we need to uh, live right so but because of this particular illness and the aftermath of this illness you have to adjust your expectations as you go along so have realistic goals all right so that what you're trying to achieve here we are trying to achieve to decrease the stress you you're stressful you're more anxious you're more anxious you are working you are you are challenging your cardiovascular system then again you become breathless so it's a vicious cycle so all these deep breathing control breathing you can you can adapt, you can uh, you know adopt at that time okay so that and also you should just pace yourself i've been keeping i've been repeating this because with the any or any of the programs they mention and it is obvious that you have to pace yourself do not push yourself all right and you have to ease back into these activities and let others help you most important there is no harm in asking for help because you may do more harm to yourself by not asking help of others so as i discussed earlier it does affect you know the cognition the memory the physical aspect of the patients or the patients who have suffered through the illness so what what can you do so we have described in detail about the physical exercise and how and we do know that it elevates the mood all right so it's like a treatment to both aspects and multiple aspects all right and brain exercises what could this be simple puzzles or you know playing chess but you know kind of what what is the importance of reminders because you might have problems with memorizing things so you do you might have missed something very important you're supposed to do in the day So do keep reminders so that you reduce that particular stress on yourself. Again, add some te- relaxation techniques, deep breathing, get set realistic goals. And most importantly, again, quality of sleep. It's very important, as we all know. Affected with COVID or not, we know how much important a good sleep is for our body and the mind. So we need to prescribe ways for them to have good sleep. Uh, could be. Uh, We, and we need to sort out the help of a healthcare professional whenever needed so coming to this particular myth that is rehabilitation makes you more breathless is it true to a certain extent maybe but we do have you know a sort of way out of it because the more breathless you are you become anxious and i told you about that vicious cycle so breathlessness should improve as you increase your activities and exercise So what are they trying to tell here? That your breathlessness will improve as you increase your activity and exercise, and your tolerance increases. So that goes to say that there could be mild to moderate breathlessness while you do these exercises. So what can you do for them? There are certain positions which are there to ease breathlessness, like could be like high side lying, where you you know stack a pile of pillows and lie on the side, as you can see in the picture. could be forward lean sitting you lean forward on the table with the pillow you know supporting your head and neck with your arms to the sides of the pillow and take good deep breaths for could be forward leaning sitting without the table could be just forward lean standing with help of a wall you can just lean back on the wall and stand for a while to ease this breathlessness and standing with back support all right so most importantly what happens so you are trying to trying to manage your breathlessness by all these uh, kind of positions or the uh, kind of modes of sitting or lying down all right but the red alert is if it doesn't stop by this and you start sweating shortness of breath increases your dyspnea chest pain palpitations you need you know what to prescribe to them and what they need to be doing is asking seeking immediate medical help all right So coming to the summary, 
So it's to create awareness amongst the masses about the importance of rehabilitation after recovering from acute COVID-19 infection. So as you can see, we just help you helping uh, the individuals bounce back to their pre-COVID state. But we have to keep in mind that it takes time and we have to educate them in the similar fashion. All right. So basically, again, we're keeping in mind so that we prevent progression into post-COVID chronic pain syndromes. A lot of literature on this right now. Patients are having, why? Because they, what are the risk factors over here? We'll be talking about in a short while. Chronic pain as a sequelae of COVID-19 is multifactorial and complex and rehabilitation plays a vital role in its prevention. All right. So do we need it here? Let's add one more myth, shall we? So all chronic pain that start after getting infected by COVID-19 is due to the disease itself. Is that true? So as I mentioned about the risk factors in just uh, two minutes back that all pain what you ex uh, experience during COVID-19 may not be because of the disease per se. So for that, when you need to seek help, okay, and then the medical professional will see whether you had any risk factors. That means to say you could be having a chronic pain condition even before you acquire the COVID-19 infection and that could be exacerbated. So it has the potential to exacerbate the uh, existing chronic pain conditions even more and who's going to help you in this aspect uh, a medical care professional healthcare professional especially like a chronic pain doctor all right so it could be because of that and how it causes this particular pain syndromes and how does it affect we do have a webinar on that in the near future so i'm not going to deal in a very depth of it but we know that it affects the central nervous system and these are just the, you know, the result of the defensive mechanism which the body has for any infection, especially this uh, overwhelming viral infection. All right. So the, we have seen that there are a lot of myalgias and uh, especially the uh, literature quotes, shoulder pain and knee pain. And also if you have any other pain like the back pain with radicular symptoms, that means that there could be a, a query, a disc issue, a PIVD, an intervertebral disc issue. So don't be, uh, don't be correlating everything to the COVID-19 co consequence. It could be something new or it could be an exacerbation of what you already have. So do kindly contact your medical care professional and seek, seek important advice in a timely fashion. All right. So with this, I would like to end my talk and uh, this is nothing been, nothing but uh, a road to recovery from the COVID-19 illness, a little bit of awareness on this. Thank you. And uh, these are my references.